Welcome back to another episode of Breen Machine Video Blog. I'm your host, John Breen, and today we're going to talk about setting up the image for industrial vision inspection. This can be a tough thing to do if you've never done it before, if you're used to photography or just not industrial vision inspection, but it's really quite easy. So come on, controls champions, let's dive right in. So here we are inside the software. This is uh, Cognex Insight Explorer. Last time we left off with the getting connected step. And I wanna point out that these application steps here, this really is a good guideline for how to think about your application. You're obviously gonna get connected, you're gonna set up the image, then you're gonna do the programming, figure out your outputs and communication, save it, run it, test it, whatever you do. Extra important when you're setting up the image, I'm gonna click on this button here so we get some of these options. If you set this up and you think it's okay and then you decide later that you wanna change it, you're gonna to have to change everything else downstream too, or at least all the programming will likely have to be adjusted to compensate for that change. So really try to get this right the first time. It's not always possible, but you know, give it, give it a good effort. There are a few different things that I wanna talk about for getting a good image. First of all, you'll notice this is very dark. I don't know if you can even see it on your screen right now. I've got a penny here and a penny here and a penny here on what should be a white background, a white table. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just so I can see anything, I'm gonna change the exposure time. This is how long the, the shutter is open in the camera to expose light to the sensor inside the camera. If it's a really bright environment, you don't wanna have the shutter open for very long. If it's a really dark environment, you wanna have it open for longer to capture that. So I'm just gonna click up until I see an image. Great, I see something. So I can see three pennies and a white background. Obviously it's not in focus at all, this is still blurry. Before I move on from exposure, let me mention one more thing. Um, aside from just getting the right brightness that we want, exposure also affects, obviously, how quickly we're capturing the image. So if a part is moving, we really don't want a long exposure because we're going to get motion blur. So if there's a moving part, if there's some vibration even, we want to get a really fast exposure, a really short exposure time. So something to think about while you're setting one of these up. Now, normally, uh, we would also be talking about aperture here, and I'll get to aperture later because this sensor doesn't have an adjustable aperture, but I'm gonna, I'll get to the demonstration later, but I'm gonna talk about what it is right now for a sec. The aperture is sort of like the iris in your eyeball. It's a circular opening that can expand or contract and let in more light or less light. And similar to exposure, it's a way for us to brighten up the image or make it darker depending on the lighting conditions. But it also has an effect on the focal depth. And what do I mean by that? Well, if some parts are, let's say parts are coming through on a conveyor and some parts are taller than other parts, we want the camera to be able to focus on both of those parts at different distances from the camera. That's what I'm talking about when I say focal depth. If we open the aperture up wide, and uh, aperture is also called f-stop um, sometimes, if we open that up wide to let in a lot of light, we're going to end up with a very short focal depth. So we probably won't be able to focus on both of those parts at the same time. If we have the aperture very tight, then we won't have as much light coming in, so we'll have to have a longer exposure time or brighter lights or whatever, but we'll have a much better, a much longer focal depth. So we would be able to see both of those parts in focus at the same time with the same focal setting. Okay, so I promised you that I would get around to using a lens with an adjustable aperture that we can play with. So that's what I've gotten ready to do here. This is the lens and the style of lens we would call a C-mount that refers to the threads on here that mount up into the camera. And to be able to put this lens on the camera, I had to take a number of things off. Recall this is an autofocus lens, so here is the autofocus lens that was in there. Just comes out with a few screws. This is the color filter that lets only red light in. This is the light ring, and those are red LEDs. And then this is the diffuser. And we 
talk about these in a little more detail in a, in a lighting video. So check that out. This is what the camera looks like with all of the bits taken out. I'm just going to screw this lens in there so that we can start playing with it and look at how it affects the image. Okay, so if we look at the computer screen here, I can see that I'm getting an image. It's not quite in focus. It's probably not quite the right brightness. So let's just mess with this a little bit. I'm gonna try and keep my fingers out of the way of the picture, but since I have to reach up into the assembly here to access this, uh, maybe I'll get in your way a little bit. Hopefully this works okay. First, I'm just gonna try and focus it a little bit better. I want you to notice right now that I can focus on either the Legrand name or I can focus on the Breen Machine logo in the back there. Notice that they're at different depths here. This is low and this is high. And I'm pointing this out because when we change the aperture, we can actually change the depth of focus. And you might think about this like binoculars in the woods where you can focus on exactly one branch, but not the branch in front of it and not the branch behind it. That's because of the way the aperture is set in those. Right now I'm adjusting the focus ring. Why don't I put that adjustment and I'll set our focus region here. Let's say I'm trying to, trying to focus right here. Let's say okay, and when we go back to live video, now this number represents just the focus there. It's all right about. Somewhere around there seems close. Because this is a lab setup, every time I touch it, I change the distance to the part just a little bit. We'll call that good. Okay, so now I'm gonna try and do this without getting my fingers in the way. So that got a little bit lighter. That's me opening the aperture. And this is really worst case scenario when we're talking about um, the depth of focus. So notice I can focus on the logo. I really have bad focus on the Legrand label. At the same time though, I'm getting a reasonable exposure at only three milliseconds. You know, I might brighten this a little bit, say to six milliseconds if I'm trying to inspect this. But now the focus is extra bad here because now it's washed out and out of focus. So let's take a look at what happens when I bring the aperture the other way. So I'm closing the aperture right now. Notice it's getting a lot darker. It's so dark we can barely see anything. It's all the way closed now, which means it's, it's just open like a pinhole. If I bring the exposure up, we can make it brighter again. Notice how in focus both of these are. This is that depth of focus that I'm talking about. We can have a much deeper range of what things we can expect, inspect this way. And this is something that we can use to our advantage in either direction. If we need a really fast exposure, we probably have to go with a wide open aperture because we get more light that way. If it doesn't matter so much, now we can choose. Do I want to be able to see parts that are both near and far? Or do I want to ignore everything that's too far away and too close and really only have good focus on something at a very specific distance from the camera? just gonna play with the focus a little bit more. Notice how both depths seem to come in and out of focus together. Rather than getting focus on one or the other, we get focus on both or none. So here's a close up of that lens. Just wanted to point a few things out. This ring here is the focus from infinity to 200 millimeters. And then this ring here is the aperture, also called f-stop or f-number. You might see this represented as a fraction with f in it somewhere. 
the smallest number here is when we're widest open. The biggest number is when we're mostly closed. And I'll do this for the camera. Hopefully you can see it. And this is just like the aperture or uh, rather the iris of your eye. You can let more light in or it can block more light. And because of the way the optics work, this also affects the depth of focus. Coming back to the image now, this is a pretty good starting point for, you know, having having a picture that we can work with. Now let's start to work with focus. Most of the time I'm setting up a camera, I've got a little ring, a focus ring on the lens that I can adjust. In this case, again, this is an autofocus lens. So I can set the focus position manually if I want to by clicking through this. Looks like that's making it less focused. So if I come this way, and it's getting more focused, I'm headed in the right direction. There's a trick to this though, even beyond the autofocus, which I'll use in a second. If I set the live video, if I turn this on, so things are moving right now, notice there's a focus number right here. The higher that number, the better the focus. So I can just watch that number and click through my focus position, say, okay, I must be going in the right direction because that focus number is increasing. And this is the same thing that the autofocus does. It's gonna try a bunch of things and say, well, wherever the highest number was, notice I just, by the way, I just, I'm still going the same direction and the focus number is going back down. So I just passed the optimal focus. And this is the same thing you're gonna do with your eyeball, except it's giving a real number to what we're doing. Now, sometimes you've got part of an image, like maybe I wanna focus on these two pennies and everything out here, I don't care about for the focus. So looking at this number, well, what, what is it looking at for its focus? That's what this focus region is. If I click on that, it looks like it was fairly close to those two pennies that I said I wanted to focus on. So let's just adjust it like that and say, okay, now I know our focus will be on those two pennies. If I click us back over to live video, got that focus number. I'll click on autofocus. And you might actually hear it. It'll, it'll be trying a bunch of different focal settings and then it'll come back with an optimal number. That'll probably be pretty close to this 124. So it came back with 125. How about that? Okay, so this is optimal focus. Now, sorry, I, when I'm bumping my desk, I'm shaking the camera a little bit. Um, obviously, that's something you want to avoid when you're uh, doing this on a real machine, a lab, in a lab environment like this on the table, it's not as important because I can always just delete a picture if it gets motion blur or whatever. Another thing I want to talk about when we're looking at how bright the picture is, is gain. We've got this number here and it's not accessible when we're in live video. Gain is sometimes also called amplifier gain. This is, I, I believe it's a real hardwired thing inside the camera. We could just think about it like it's artificially brightening the image. I'm going to show you an example of that because I think that'll be a lot easier to understand. I'm going to take us out of live video and let's play with gain. Oh, uh, first of all, in the live video, just take a moment to notice pixels in here change just a little bit, but the image is pretty stable. This is a live image again. It's fairly crisp. It's, it's fairly good quality. So if I come back out of live video and I change the gain to the max, which in this case is six, I come back to live video. First of all, it is super bright. Okay. Cause that's what gain does. I'm going to back off the exposure time to give you a picture that you'll still be able to see. Notice with that picture, see how, how much it looks like pixels are dancing. This is just extra noise, extra electrical noise in the sensor, in the circuit. Even the focus number is bouncing around. And this is uh, just the effect of high gain. So you get a brighter image, you can use a shorter exposure time to get the same brightness, but you have all this noise to deal with. I would generally recommend just don't use the gain at all, leave it at zero, unless you just really need a faster exposure and you don't have another way to do it. So I'll turn that back to zero and I'll bring this back to, I think six we had it at. And if I go back to the live video, again, this focus number is much more stable. The pixels aren't dancing as much. That's a good thing. Depending on our application, we want to set this up in different ways. And we always want to set up the image 
in a way that has very strong contrast, really highlights the things that we care about and downplays plays the things that we don't care about. And in large part, that's a lighting consideration. But for the sake of this demonstration here, I'm just gonna show you what I'm looking for. Let's say, let's say we're looking at one penny and we know that one penny is always coming through here. I'm going to just move this around a little bit. Now, I can see that penny just fine with my eyeballs. I can tell it's there. And if I go past like here, yeah, I can still see that penny just fine, no problem. But in those two extreme examples, there isn't as much contrast on the edges of the penny or on the face of the penny. And again, depending on what we want to look at, if we want to look at the face of the penny, that's the part we care about. If we want to look at the edges, that's what we're looking at. But if I bring this back down, at some point, I'm going to find a place that's right around there where the part is almost black and the background is almost white. This is about as good as it gets. We're looking for that really high contrast, especially again, if we're, if we're looking to see the silhouette of this, that's, that's where the contrast needs to be. So if I'm doing an application where I'm just looking for a circle or I'm measuring a circle, that's what we're looking for. And this is very common. You'll see it everywhere. Often you get the same effect with backlighting because the back of the part or the, the background is actually the light and then the part just looks like a, a shadow of a circle or whatever shape the part is. Speaking of lighting, I want to go into this in much more depth in a future video, but I'm going to show you briefly what lighting setup might look like. In this case, we have a built-in light on the camera, which is really convenient. There are plenty of times when that's not the case, but I'm happy to have that for this demonstration. If I open up the lighting, by the way, right now in the background, this is just ambient lighting. And sometimes that's fine. Uh, I've got some light coming in the window. I've got some light coming from my office lights uh, and it's lit up fine. But what if I want this to run at nighttime? That's probably gonna look pretty different when there's no light coming in the window. So there are things that we can't control. And uh, you know, what about shadows? If I move around here, we get some shadowing. And again, those things all affect your inspection. So usually we would advise against ambient lighting. Okay, so coming back to light settings, this is kind of the shape of our light. We've got some lights um, around in a rectangle like this. And I'm gonna click over to integrated. Now, if you see over here, we've got kind of a strobe light show going on. I'm going to try and avert my eyes so I don't get a seizure. This is doing this because we've got the exposure time set so long, set seven milliseconds is long when you have a, a light like this. I'm going to just bring that down so it's something more reasonable. Notice also that background there, it was very, very bright. We've got our gain at zero on everything. So even one millisecond is too much exposure. Why don't we try? Point two, let's see what that looks like. Okay, went a little too far. How about point three? That's getting a little more reasonable. Let's try point four, um, and we can keep coming back and changing this as much as we want. It just won't be with the arrows because those move by one at a time. How about point five? Or point six? Okay, so somewhere in that range. Let's just start with 0.5 for now. Notice also, we've got the light on now. Uh, in this other shot, you can see it's not flickering nearly as much, although it still is you know, blinking every time it takes a picture. Notice also that this penny that used to not look shiny, we didn't have all these white spots on it. We've got white spots on it now. So depending on what we're trying to measure, like if we're trying to find that circle, this might be a bad thing. You see, we've got a dark line and then a white line and then a dark line again on the edge all the way around. Those reflections probably aren't gonna be helpful for our inspection, especially like I say, if we're trying to find a good edge, now we've got a really tough edge to find. It's, uh, you know, it's got these stripes on it. Now that's a dirty, dirty penny. What if I bring in a shiny dime? You see the issue is, uh, is way worse. So. Again, just a very brief lighting demonstration. Um, in, in this case, backlighting or ambient lighting might even be better.
So now that we've talked about all these little pieces, I want to just walk through my general strategy. When you start out, you've got a focus that's wrong, you've got an aperture that's wrong, you don't know what your exposure needs to be, and uh, you know you, you you're just starting at ground zero. You've got uh, you're, you're starting with a blank slate. You've got nothing. So um, the way I like to do it is first set the aperture and the exposure so they're in the ballpark. So in this case, um, I'm going to just turn that light back off so that it's a little easier for us to change our exposure. And again, that's a dull penny and a shiny dime, just for an example. Let's, let's say just the penny. Again, we'll be consistent with that. Okay, so here's Here's about right, it's, uh, you know, I see dark and I see fairly white, that's pretty close. So whatever I've done with my aperture and my exposure right now is pretty good. So then I would come back and do a focus. In this case, again, we'll do an autofocus. It'll do its thing, it's probably gonna come back at exactly 125 again. The first round there, I was getting enough brightness that I could set the focus at all, just so I could get the focus. And then I would come back and I would fine tune exposure and aperture. So maybe instead of 6.5, I want 6. No, that didn't seem to help us. What if we go to 7? Yeah, again, now I've got basically black and basically white touching. That's good contrast. So big aperture lets through a lot of light. Small aperture doesn't let through a lot of light. And this is also called f-stop. Uh, I don't know why they call it f-stop. Um, but the f number that goes with this term f-stop a really big F number is a really small aperture. And a really small F number, or sometimes you'll see it in a fraction, a small F number is a big, wide open aperture. So thanks again for joining us. I hope you found that helpful. Um, I really like making these videos for you guys and I, I love hearing your feedback. So please leave comments, share it with your friends, uh, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you next time.